Okay, we are talking about religion's impact on the cultural landscape, so you should take a moment to set up your notes to look like these. So before we get started and after you set up your notes, I want to tell you kind of the main idea here. Um, when we look at these religious elements, we can see how religion has impacted people's culture, their livelihoods, and the way that places have been constructed. So when we look at these religious elements, such as places of worship, toponyms, sacred spaces, and burial practices, we see how religion creates this sense of place and this cultural landscape. Okay, so let's talk about places of worship first, okay? And we're going to start with Christianity. Christianity is a um, collective service of worship. People come together and worship together. Um, and so the style of construction of Christian churches um, is that traditionally they are the largest and the tallest buildings that are placed in really important places in Christian communities, and they are... Um, they have steeples, which are these large towers pointing towards the sky, and we see a lot of crosses included in architectural elements. Um, however, since Christianity um, has been split into three different branches and then smaller denominations within those branches, we don't see one single style of church construction. So for instance, Orthodox Christianity, um, the churches look like this. They are very ornate um, and topped with domes, very colorful as well. And this is what the inside of what one of these um, Orthodox Christianities churches would look like. Now, this was developed in the Byzantine Empire and reflects those architectural elements of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. However, if you look at Protestant churches, um, there is an example right here of a Protestant church. These are very simple with little ornamentation that are built very simply, um, oftentimes with whatever is available in the environment in which they were built. And this is the inside of a Protestant church. Now, these are just examples. You may see different variations, uh, but kind of a major example to think about. And then here is St. Cecilia. This is a, um, a Christian Catholic church in Oakley, very close to where we live. Um, and this style of church, the Catholic style of church, is called a cathedral. And so these are usually made out of stone. They are very large and ornate, very similar to the Eastern Orthodox type of churches, but not as colorful, and you can see they include these steeples and bells. Another group place of worship is a Muslim mosque. These are mostly found in large cities, and as you can probably tell by looking at this, domes are very important when you're thinking about Muslim mosques. Okay, This is the main architectural style of a mosque. Um, Something else that you need to know, which is also very important, is that um, the architectural style of a mosque is also going to have this large tower that you can see here. You can see the examples of the towers in, in here. Um, and this example is harder to see, but it's back here. And these towers are called a minaret. M-I-N-A-R-E-T. And this is a tower uh, that is used to summon people to worship. So when you're thinking about Muslim mosques, you need to know that they typically have domes and they have minarets. Lastly, this idea of a mosque is typically organized around a central courtyard. So you can see in this example from Mecca that the mosque is um, organized around this very open air environment in the center. And the pulpit faces Mecca. So this is dir the direction towards which all um, Muslims pray. Okay, another collective place of worship or group worship is a Jewish synagogue. Sometimes synagogues are called temples as well, um, and there isn't really a uniform architectural style. Um, however, we do see some similar elements on all uh, Jewish synagogues. First of all, the Star of David is very prominent, usually. Uh, you can see it here. Um, inside here. You can also see it here. So we're going to see the Star of David oftentimes um, on a Jewish synagogue. 
And we are also going to see Hebrew text. So you can see Hebrew written here and here, and you can also see Hebrew on the outside of this synagogue here. Now these examples are from kind of all different places. This is the largest synagogue um, in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, and this is the inside of it, so you can kind of see um, what it looks like there. However, this synagogue is in New York, and then this synagogue, which you can see the inside of this one here, is found in Maryland. So Again, know that there isn't any specific architectural style, but you do see Hebrew text in the Star of David. Okay, so now let's talk about places of worship that are more individualized. So from here on out, I'm not going to be talking about group worship. Um, let's talk about Buddhism. In Buddhism, you're going to see two structures um, that are considered places of worship. One is called a pagoda, and the other is called a stupa. And on these examples here, you can see this example here, here, and here. These are the pagodas, and then these examples are of the stupas. So let me talk to you about what a pagoda is. Um, these are tall. Uh, they have many sides, and they look like towers. They're also arranged in a series of tiers um, and uh, balconies with slanting roofs. So Although these three look very different, they all kind of have these things in common. And this is a place for individual prayer and meditation in Buddhism, um, although the majority of that occurs in people's homes. Um, now let's talk about what a stupa is. These um, are representative of uh, Buddha himself and living in harmony with nature. Um, so the earliest stupas in Buddhism actually contained portions of Buddha's ashes. And as a result, um, the stupa began to be associated with the body of Buddha. Um, People go to these stupas, just like they do the uh, pagodas, to individually worship um, and meditate on their religion. Okay, for Hinduism. Um, Hindu places of worship are called temples, and they are also individual places of worship as well. Um, these structures were designed to bring people closer to their gods and serve as almost like a shrine to their gods as well. Um, these structures are very ornate. So you can see this example here as well as this one. They are carved stone um, and the carvings are usually of the gods that each temple is supposed to worship. Um, these gods are depicted both by human and animal representations and most of the time they are very, very colorful. Um, as I said, this is a place for individual reflection and meditation because most religious functions happen in people's homes and with their families in um, Hinduism. Uh, but while we're here, I want to show you that this example and this example are both from India. Here's an example of a Hindu temple in um, Cincinnati. It does not look similar to the ones from India at all. So keep in mind that as these uh, religions diffuse, um, this is obviously an instance of relocation diffusion, um, and so a Hindu temple in Cincinnati is not really going to mirror what a true Hindu temple would look like in India. Lastly, these three photos here are of one of the largest Hindu temple complexes um, that was um, built in Cambodia, and it is called Angkor Wat. Now it is used by Buddhists, but previously it was a Hindu temple. Okay, so Shintoism, um, again, we see a lot of individual meditation, uh, but we also see this huge emphasis of nature and connecting with nature. Um, and so 
these things right here are called Tory gates. And Tory gates are located, you can see one on top of this rock here, um, are located in these places to mark a transition from a human world to a more sacred and religious world. Um, so they are the entrances to Shinto shrines or places that are considered sacred. Um, Tori gates are found all over Japan, um, and uh, most people go there for individual worship and meditation. Okay, our next topic is toponyms. Remember, a toponym is just a place's name, um, and so I've got some examples here to show you. Um, for instance, uh, Catholic examples, we see a lot of Catholic-oriented um, places named after saints. So you can see here in Quebec, um, also St. Paul, Minnesota, in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, that is Latin for body of Christ. So these are kind of all three Catholic examples. We also see the Christmas Islands here off of Australia. Um, and then lastly, another example is Judenberg. Um, and this translates to Jew Jews town. And these um, places called Judenberg can be found across Europe. Okay, let's move on to talking about sacred spaces and take a moment to compare and contrast ethnic and universalizing religions here. A universalizing religion usually associates holiness with cities and other places that are influential to the founder's life. So, for instance, the place that Buddha was born or Muhammad was born. They're not necessarily related to the physical environment. However, ethnic religions have a less widespread distribution of these sacred spaces, and they are typically related to the physical environment. Um, and lastly, let's talk about what a pilgrimage is. This is a, an adherent of really any religion who journeys or who makes a journey to a place considered sacred. So let's talk about Buddhism first. There are eight places that are considered holy in Buddhism because they were important locations of the events in Buddha's life. That also matches the significance of the number eight in Buddhism with the eightfold path. For most, uh, four of the most important are concentrated in northeastern India and southern Nepal. The first one is Lumbini, which is birth the birthplace of Buddha. The second is Bodh Gaya, uh, which you can find right here. This is where Buddha attained enlightenment for the very first time. Uh, the second one is Deer Park at Sarnath, which is where Buddha's first sermon was. And this is also where the Dhammic Stupa is found. Uh, that was built in the third century. It's right here. And then the last, um, kind of the most important, is um, Kusangara, which is right here, which is where um, Buddha actually died and passed into Nirvana. Sacred spaces in Islam are associated with the life of Muhammad. So the first sacred space is Mecca. This is where we find the great mosque as well as the Kaaba. And then we also um, see that um, this is where the majority of pilgrimages are done for Muslims. Now, this Kaaba is a cube-like structure, you can see here, that is encased in silk, and it stands at the center of this great mosque. Um, it is significant to kind of the history of Islam and the lineage of Islam, and um, this is kind of the, the main attraction here at the Great Mosque. Remember the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to, to Mecca, is expected of all Muslims. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. Um, so we see huge numbers of people coming to Mecca and Saudi Arabia. Medina is also significant. This is where um, Muhammad and the um, Muslims are forced to move. Um, and also it is where Muhammad died. So you can see Muhammad's tomb at Medina as well. Sacred spaces in Hinduism, um, there's really just one. Um, it's closely rely or tied to physical geography, right? Um, and it is the Ganges River. Uh, this is the holiest river, and um, Hindus believe that it springs from the hair of Shiva. So we see a lot of ritual bathing happening in the Ganges River, um, and this leads to a lot of pollution. Um, and we'll get to kind of the burial practices here in a minute, but um, the Ganges River is kind of the central location for Hindu um, 
not Hindus. We also see on the cultural landscape, though, holy animals, right? So the cow is holy in Hinduism. And so we see these free roaming cows throughout India.